thing unnaturally due to climate change can cause beaches to erode at an alarming rate, undermining the integrity of our natural coastal protection systems. Erosion has already diminished portions of our 520-mile coastline, and our sea level is projected to rise an additional two and a half feet by 2050. During Hurricane Sandy, we lost over 3.5 million cubic yards of sand in the Rockaways and over half a million cubic yards of sand in Coney Island. With beach erosion and retreating coastlines, seawater can encroach on the city's infrastructure and people's homes at higher rates. Inevitably, this would also lead to greater economic burdens for the city and our constituents. The city, in partnership with the Army Corps, have tried to address these concerns through some coastal protection projects uh, in Coney Island, the Rockaways, and Staten Island, uh, which the state has identified as coastal erosion hazard areas. Uh, through a variety of measures such as engineered seed walls, tea groins, artificial reefs, and other structures, uh, they have attempted to try to address uh, this issue of, of erosion. In addition, the Army Corps has provided over 90,000 cubic yards of sand uh, after Superstorm Sandy. But I just want to note that a good, number, a, good, a good amount of that sand is already gone from Coney Island and Brighton Beach. We must be vigilant. The committees are interested in the city's short and long-term strategies to protect our shorelines and our communities. For instance, we'd like more information on the sand replenishment that has taken place after, the, after Sandy, particularly since we are now staring down another hurricane season. In addition, we'd like insights on any regional funding the city is pursuing to ensure our city's resiliency and well-being in the long run. Climate change is not the future, it is now. It was Sandy and other weather events that have been taking place globally, and quite frankly, it doesn't even take a Sandy to create this enormous impact. A nor'easter can be the storm that could really do a lot of damage as well to a coastal community. And without a doubt, we will see more storm surges with the capability of wiping out our shorelines in relatively little time. So the question is, what can we do about this urgent issue? The committees look forward to hearing testimony today from the Office of Recovery and Resiliency, the Department of Parks and Recreation, and the Army Corps of Engineers, as well as community advocates. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And I'm now going to ask someone who's been leading on this issue across the city, our public advocate, Tish James, to offer an opening statement. And in the meantime, I'll ask um, uh, Deputy uh, Commissioner Liam Cavanaugh to prepare for the first panel. Thank you. I want to thank um, Chairs Levine and Trigger, as well as their staffs and the committee staffs for holding this hearing today and inviting me to participate. Nearly five years ago, our city experienced one of the worst natural disasters in memory when Superstorm Sandy made landfall. We will never forget the destruction, the sadness, and devastation caused by the storm, but more importantly, we will never forget the unity and strength and resiliency of our city. Federal funds eventually came in, and the city and state dedicated significant resources to recovery. Much has been done, but there are places in the city where serious questions remain. I'm here today because I was inspired by the Bell Harbor Property Owners Association, who I understand um, are, will be testifying today, and who continue to sound a clarion call to guard against whatever's next. They led me to understand that the FEMA money that helped rebuild the board, boardwalk was simply not enough, and that focus on what is most important, safeguarding against the next storm, has perhaps been lost. The temporary burns, berms put in place by the Army Corps of Engineers are now eroding. Too much beach was washed away. We risk devastation the next time a storm comes. In these fraught climate, we do not know how much we can count on the federal government's aid in preparing for the future and coping with the next great storm, which is why today's hearing is so important. Despite all the work that has been done, there are weak spots throughout, particularly in the Rockaways. There remain places where berms and rock jetties and sand re replenishment uh, uh, and bulkheads and reefs and seawalls are still desperately needed. If relatively mild storms are threatening beaches with collapse, are we ready for a hurricane? I say no. We need to know that what, the, what the agencies are doing, how we can count on them, how they are coordinating and doing what's necessary, and we need to know whether or not there are additional resources we still need. And we need to know what we can do to advocate with uh, and for um, the residents of the Rockaways as well as Coney Island with our state and federal partners. 
Uh, local residents and local officials are calling for immediate action, fearing that we are already are in a state of emergency. And the people who know these beaches best make clear that we cannot be complacent. We must show them that we are listening and we must take action. Again, I thank the two chairs for allowing me um, to participate and for allowing me to say a few comments. I thank you so much. Thank you, Madam Public Advocate. So now we'd like not only Deputy Commissioner Cavanaugh representing the Parks Department, but also representing the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, Anthony Chiori, to please uh, join us for the first panel, and we'll let you two duke it out to decide who speaks first. Okay, our um, committee council will administer the affirmation. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this committee today? There we go. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Anthony Ciora. I am the uh, chief of the Coastal Restoration Branch with the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers New York District. I'm very pleased to be here today uh, to testify on behalf of the Corps of Engineers. Uh, first off, I want to thank uh, Council Member Traeger and the Committee on Recovery and Resiliency and Council Member Levine and the Committee on Parks and Recreation uh, for the invitation to testify here and the opportunity to provide an update on the status of the Corps of Engineers post-Sandy coastal recovery efforts in the city of New York. As the Hurricane Sandy program manager, uh, my responsibility is to lead and manage the execution of the New York District's $3.5 billion coastal restoration program, uh, which includes parts of New York City, uh, coastal Long Island, and northern New Jersey as far south as the Manasquan Inlet. We have confidence that the experience that uh, we have uh, the experiences that we have encountered so far under the Sandy Recovery Program and the lessons learned will lead us to future success uh, as we continue with our recovery efforts. Uh, the collaboration between government agencies, stakeholders, and the general public and private sector are critical to continued success of our recovery efforts. Uh, the strong interagency intergovernmental teamwork has been crucial to meet uh, the challenges and continues to be critical as we move forward with post-Sandy coastal recovery efforts. And I, I do want to uh, acknowledge uh, the outstanding partnership that we have with the, the City of New York, uh, whether that be the Mayor's Office of uh, recover, Recovery and Resiliency, uh, the New York City Parks Department, uh, as well as the New York City Department of Environmental Protection. Uh, moving forward with our partners, the Corps has developed, maintained, and applied uh, expertise in science and engineering to restore and enhance the resilience uh, of the New York City coastline. Uh, the primary purpose of our coastal restoration projects is to reduce risk to life and property to vulnerable communities. Uh, shore protection and flood risk reduction have always been crucial. Uh, projects such as these have taken on greater significance with the expected uh, climate and sea level change, uh, especially now following Hurricane Sandy. Uh, our recovery efforts that the New York District has accomplished in New York City since Sandy uh, includes placing millions of cubic yards of sand along the coastline to repair and restore completed coastal storm risk reduction projects that were previously constructed by the Corps of Engineers and are now maintained by New York City. Uh, these projects were severely impacted by Sandy and were repaired at 100 percent federal cost using what we call flood control and coastal emergencies funding. Over 7 million cubic yards of sand were placed in coastal areas within the state of New York, with approximately 4 million of this placed within the city of New York beaches. Uh, the majority of that Beachville placement, approximately 3.4 million cubic yards, was placed along Rockaway Beach in Queens. An additional 600 cubic yards was placed on Coney Island in Brooklyn. The sand placed at both Rockaway and Coney Island was sufficient not only to repair damages to the project resulting from Sandy, but restored these beaches to their original design profile. We also repaired a damaged levee and tide gate at Oakwood Beach on Staten Island uh, that, that was also repaired with uh, Sandy FCC funds 
at a federal cost of approximately half a million dollars. The sand that was used to replenish these beaches was beneficially used by dredging material from the East Rockaway Inlet and Jamaica Bay or Rockaway Inlet Federal Navigation Channels at, at both Rockaway and Coney Island and, and used to restore these projects to their authorized design conditions. Uh, this enabled us to save a, a significant amount of federal dollars in that we were able to clear out federal navigation channels that had shoaled in as, as a result of the storm and to use that sand beneficially at the nearby beaches in order to restore them to their pre-project conditions. One of our New York City sandy recovery projects is already physically complete. Uh, we have completed construction of the Coney Island Tea Groins project uh, back in 2016, and I'm happy to say it's functioning as designed. Uh, this work was not directly related to the emergency FCC work that I mentioned earlier, but is also being accomplished at 100% federal cost as what we call an authorized but unconstructed project that was defined as ongoing construction because it received federal construction appropriations prior to Sandy. This $33 million project includes the construction of four tea groins along the beaches of the Seagate community that are now providing protection to the overall Coney Island public beach by retaining sand on the downdrift beaches west of the 37th Street Terminal groin. I will now provide an update on the three major coastal storm risk management projects that are located in New York City that remain to be completed. That's the East Rockaway Inlet to Rockaway Inlet and Jamaica Bay reformulation study, the South Shore of Staten Island Coastal Storm Risk Management Project, and the New York, New Jersey Harbor and Tributaries Focus Area Study. First off, the East Rockaway to Rockaway Inlet and Jamaica Bay reformulation study uh, will recommend authorization of a project for coastal storm risk reduction from Gravesend Bay, Brooklyn, to Coney Island, Manhattan Beach, Sheepshead Bay, Garrison Beach, and Breezy Point out to Far Rockaway. The project is expected to cost nearly $4 billion total, and a final report is expected to be prepared by March of 2018. This project will include closure gates in Coney Island Creek, Sheepshead Bay, Garrison Creek, and across Rockaway, Rockaway Inlet and uh, will also include shoreline, Atlantic shoreline alternatives, including new groins, reinforced dunes, and beach construction uh, that are in the footprint of the existing federal project that runs from approximately Beach 9th Street to a Beach 149th Street in Rockway Beach. Because the total cost of the project exceeds the total available funding available under the Sandy Recovery Program, the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers will seek to implement only those portions of the project that are incrementally justified from an economic standpoint and have separate utility from an environmental standpoint with the available Sandy funding. Elements that are constructed using the Public Law 113-2 or Sandy Disaster Relief Appropriations Act funding will be built with the 100 percent federal funding and the Corps anticipates up to $400 million available for these efforts. The construction of the earliest elements of the project are currently scheduled to begin in late 2019. Next project, South Shore of Staten Island, uh, also referred to uh, by Staten Island locals as the East Shore project, will run five and a half miles of coastline from the foot of the Verrazano Narrows Bridge at Fort, Wad uh, Fort Wadsworth to Oakwood Beach. The design phase is underway in close partnership with our non-federal sponsors, the New York State Department of Environmental Conservation and the City of New York. Additional coordination is also underway with various other federal agencies, including the National Park Service and the National Resources Conservation Service and the Federal Emergency Management Agency. The final feasibility report for the Staten Island Project and Environmental Impact Statement were formally approved in October of 2016 by the Corps of Engineers Headquarters and approved by the Assistant Secretary of the Army for Civil Works in December of 2016. The design phase for preparing the plans and specifications for project construction were initiated in early 2017. The first major steps of the design phase during the current year include gathering data for overall contract designs, new surveys, utility mapping, 
geotech borings, hazardous material assessments, cultural resource investigations, all of which are currently underway or about to start this summer. Coordination is also underway with our partners at the City of New York for the required real estate acquisitions, design layouts, et cetera, that are necessary for construction of the project. We are also negotiating a project partnership agreement between the Corps of Engineers, New York State, and City of New York that is necessary before construction can start. This agreement is scheduled to be executed by the end of 2017, with project construction scheduled to begin in early 2019 and continuing through 2022. The total project cost is currently estimated to be $615 million. Cost shared between the core New York State and New York City at a 65% federal and 35% non-federal cost share, meaning that the federal share is $400 million, whereas the non-federal share is approximately $215 million. And I'm pleased to report that all of the required funding, both federal and non-federal, is now approved and in place. Finally, I'd like to brief on the New York and New Jersey Harbor and Tributaries Focus Area Study. Uh, in response to Hurricane Sandy, in January 2015, the Corps of Engineers completed the North Atlantic Coast Comprehensive Study, which identified nine focus areas between southern Maine and northern Virginia that were at high risk to coastal storm damage, but lacked an existing in-depth coastal storm risk study or project. One of these focus areas is this New York, New Jersey Harbor and Tributaries study, which encompasses all of New York City, the six largest cities in northern New Jersey, and the tidally influenced Hudson River all the way up to the Troy Lock and Dam near Albany. This is one of the most ambitious studies uh, that the Corps of Engineers is currently uh, involved with. The New York District Corps entered into an agreement with both the states of New York and New Jersey in July of 2016 uh, to initiate the study, uh, uh, building off other efforts that are presently underway in and around the region, the feasibility study will investigate coastal storm risk management problems and solutions. Uh, three overarching efforts will be formed. We will assess the study's problems, opportunities, and future without project conditions. We will assess the feasibility of implementing multifaceted system-wide coastal storm risk management solutions in a watershed context. And if basin-wide solutions are not feasible, we will assess the feasibility of implementing site-specific solutions, such as a combination of structural, non-structural, and or natural and nature-based features. The project management plan for the study is now in the process of being finalized. This describes the scope and corresponding costs, and which are all need to be compliant with Corps of Engineers' plan and policy and procedures. Uh, this project management plan represents the foundation on which subsequent coordination and input from stakeholders in the region and non-federal study partners would occur during the planning phase. This study is currently anticipated to require upwards of six years to complete from the date we executed the agreement last July and up to $20 million of federal and non-federal funds uh, with 50-50 cost sharing is most likely necessary to fully complete this study. In closing, I want to stress that the Corps of Engineers has not lost our sense of urgency for completing these projects as soon as possible in order to reduce the risk to coastal communities that remain vulnerable from the impact of future storm events. Although we understand the frustration of our stakeholders and the public that our study process requires time due to the extremely complex nature of these projects and the environment in which they are located, we are still pushing to move them forward as quickly as possible because we understand that significant risk still exists. Our Sandy Recovery Program continues to be a priority for the Corps of Engineers as we approach the fifth anniversary of the storm. Thank you again for the opportunity to testify here this afternoon. This concludes my testimony. Okay, thank, thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Curtis Cravens. I'm the Senior Advisor for Coastal Resiliency at the Mayor's Office of Recovery and Resiliency. And I want to thank Chair Levine and Chair Traeger 
as well as members of the Committee on Parks and Recreation and the Committee on Recovery and Resiliency and Public Advocate James for the opportunity to discuss the City's efforts in the issues of beach erosion. I am here today uh, with my colleagues, First Deputy Ma Commissioner uh, Liam Cavanaugh from the Department of Parks Re uh, Recreation, and I'm pleased we could be here with our federal partner, the Army Corps of Engineers, Anthony Sciorra. Thank you. ORR is pleased to participate in the hearing on beach erosion. It is a topic of importance and concern to residents, members of this committee, these committees, and to ORR and the Department of Parks and Recreation. I would like to say at the outset that the de Blasio administration understands residents' concerns about coastal erosion in their neighborhood. These concerns are rooted in our fundamental human need to ensure that our neighborhoods, homes, and families are safe. While there is no easy or quick fix here, parks and ORR share residents' sense of urgency as we work to mitigate coastal erosion as part of our larger efforts to secure the resiliency of our city in the face of unprecedented climate change. Erosion is a natural phenomenon that occurs as currents, tides, and waves interact with the coastline. In New York City, much of this erosion occurs in areas that were once wetlands or barrier islands dynamic and mutable coastal geographies that naturally eroded and shifted over time. Climate change will intensify these naturally occurring dynamics. We know this through our work with climate scientists and because we can see the evidence in stark turns on some of our beaches. The importance of well-nourished beaches was underscored by Hurricane Sandy. To complement a range of other resiliency measures, in just three years, we have placed 4.2 million cubic yards of new sand on city beaches in the Rockaways and Coney Islands, to a level that we have not seen in decades. Further, we have constructed 8.6 miles of dunes across 9.8 miles of beach in Staten Island and on the Rockaway Peninsula. These are important steps, but new challenges arise as we see in the Rockaways with erosion hotspots in the 90s and 140s where recreational beach access is compromised and residents and property owners are more vulnerable. But we also know that erosion is one of several climate change risks that the city must address to ensure a more resilient city. The city is therefore advancing a multi-layered approach to resiliency that addresses numerous climate change risks including sea level rise, increased frequency and intensity of coastal storms, increased rainfall, more frequent heat waves, and increasing temperatures. Sand is an important component of the city's resiliency strategy, but sand alone will, does not ensure resiliency. The scale and breadth of climate change-related tasks requires the de Blasio administration to work on multiple time horizons, near, medium, and long-term, to protect against the effects of climate change. Examples of long-term coastal resilience projects are tide barriers that have been studied for Coney Island Creek, Newtown Creek, and the Gowanus Canal. Medium-term projects that are funded and underway, and we expect to be completed within the next five to seven years, include the Army Corps' levy on Staten Island, Red Hook Integrated Flood Protection System, East Side Coastal Resiliency Project, Two Bridges Coastal Resiliency Project, and the Rockaways Atlantic Shoreline. The City's comprehensive resiliency plan does not rely solely on these projects. We must also address near-term sea level rise and erosion risks. Four specific initiatives address these risks. First, after a year-long study to assess the risk of sea level rise across the City, the design phase of raised shoreline citywide, a $123 million program to address sea level rise risk, is set to begin a design on the public ownership sites and that to be soon followed by sites that have a mix of public and private ownership. Highlights of this effort include $47 million in Coney Island Creek and $32 million on the south shore of Staten Island. Second, to directly mitigate risk immediately while larger, more complicated projects are under our advance, the first deputy mayor directed emergency management with the support of ORR to implement flood protection measures to reduce coastal flood risks in the very short term. In the last year, EM and ORR worked with a team of expert coastal engineers and nearly a dozen city agencies to conduct a citywide risk analysis and produce design interventions that can be constructed in a relatively quickly to mitigate coastal flooding. Emergency management will roll out these temporary measures this summer in Hunts Point, Rockaway Park, Red Hook, and Long Island City. 
Third, we are also taking immediate steps to quantify risks on the Rockaways. Because construction of the Army Corps, Barry Seawold, and Tabor Groin Field will not begin construction until 2019 or 2020, we must now quantify the extent of erosion that has occurred and identify realistic and effective solutions that can be implemented in the near term. The City will undertake survey of erosion hotspots on the Rockaway Peninsula to under analyze changes in beach profile and quantify renourishment needs. This analysis will be completed within the next 90 days. Fourth, emergency management, New York City Parks and ORR have been working with Borough President Katz over the past year to engineer sand retention measures beneath the Rockaway Boardwalk Concession Islands that will mitigate some of the risks caused by erosion and help keep sand from being pushed into Rockaway neighborhoods. In addition, Citywide, the Citywide ins Waterfront Inspection Program, initiated in, initiated in 2016, is capturing the impacts of erosion and deterioration on city-owned waterfront infrastructure such as bulkheads, piers, and beaches. Baseline surveys of Oakwood Beach and Crescent Beach in Staten Island have just been completed. In partnership with Do It and Parks, updated LIDAR is being collected and processed as we speak and will help the city understand current flood, coastal flood risk by capturing extremely high resolution topographic information. Finally, the Mayor's Office of Environmental Remediation is now implementing a pilot program and a clean, for a clean soil bank for sand and soil excavated from development sites to be used for resiliency efforts in the city. Together, these initiatives provide a foundation and concrete near-term steps to address the risk of beach erosion. As I conclude my testimony, I would like to thank the two committees for providing the administration with the opportunity to discuss this important issue. We understand your concern and frustration. We work on these problems every day. We also know that the solutions cannot come from ORR and parks alone. A resilient future for New York City demands partnership and collaboration across all actors in the city, state, and federal level. We look forward to working in partnership with the Council as we continue to make progress on protecting our city from the risks of climate change. Thank you. Okay. Good afternoon, Chair Levine, Chair Traeger, members of the Parks and Recreation Committee and the Committee on Recovery and Resiliency, and Public Advocate James. I am Liam Cavanaugh, the first Deputy Commissioner of the New York City Parks Department. Uh, thank you for inviting us uh, to, to uh, testify today uh, regarding New York City's beaches, and we welcome the opportunity to talk about uh, some of the measures we have taken since Hurricane Sandy to uh, protect our beaches, operate them for recreational uh, purposes, and also to, uh, to, to help shape the, the future of coastal resiliency in New York City. Uh, as, as Curtis said, uh, it is a, uh, a multifaceted uh, effort that involves agencies at the federal, state, and local level. Uh, we participate with many of the uh, initiatives that uh, Curtis mentioned in his testimony, uh, and as, as well as working closely with the Army Corps of Engineers, the State Department of Environmental Con Conservation, uh, and uh, local communities in, in shaping the future of our beaches. Uh, New York City Parks is a steward of 14 miles of beaches, which are open for swimming from Memorial Day uh, weekend through September 10th this year. Thank you to the Council. Uh, our recreational beaches include Orchard Beach in the Bronx, Coney Island, Brighton and Manhattan Beaches in Brooklyn, Rockaway Beach in Queens and in Staten Island, South, Midland, Wolf's Pond and Cedar Grove Beaches. As our city's beaches attract millions of visitors every year and serve an important recreational outlet for New York, the care and maintenance of these beaches is a priority for the Parks Department. But beaches are dynamic, natural environments, uh, and to some degree, shoreline change is to be expected. Beach erosion is a natural process that changes the coastline and redistributes sand at our beaches with each season. There are both natural means of erosion, including waves, winds, and storm events, as well as man-made influences that can accelerate the erosion cycle. Since coastal erosion can have a significant impact on our shorelines, it is in our best interest to prevent, minimize, and repair uh, the impact of erosion as it occurs. It's also important to address the, to, to look at our beaches in terms of the protection that they provide to the adjoining communities. For example, while recreational beaches uh, protect adjacent communities and wetlands, uh, they serve as a buffer to inland areas during coastal storms and flooding. New York City Parks and our agency partners are continually collaborating to enhance these protections and to make our coastlines even more resilient. 
Internally, as a general practice, uh, we periodically regrade sand that has moved or accumulated in certain areas of the shoreline properties during the winter season, particularly after coastal storms that are more likely to occur during the winter season. Uh, uh, but it is uh, not feasible for the Parks Department alone to undertake large-scale replenishment projects uh, of our beaches. Uh, beach replenishment is a complicated and expensive endeavor requiring federal permits and state approval, and, and shoreline protection in New York City is truly a partnership. The city has had a long and successful history of coordinating with the United States Army Corps of Engineers and the New York State Department of Environmental Conservation, who are the primary regulatory entities tasked with oversight of our, shore, of our shores. These partnerships are essential to the long-term planning, coordination, and sustainability of funding for projects targeted at combating beach erosion, developing effective beach protecting, protection, and continuing sand replenishment efforts. Prior to Hurricane Sandy, the Army Corps completed shoreline protection projects at Coney Island, Orchard Beach, Plum Beach, and Rockaway Beach. Following Sandy, uh, the, the Corps, as, as both uh, Anthony and Curtis noted, uh, renourished Coney Island, adding 600 cubic yards of sand, uh, and completed uh, needed work at the Seagate portion of Coney Island. New York City Parks uh, responded following Hurricane Sandy with an array of both short-term and, and longer-term shoreline protection and erosion control measures, including geotextile sandbags, baffle walls, sand replenishment, and retaining walls. And I will note that just a few weeks ago, we completed construction of the new boardwalk in Rockaway, running from Beach 19th Street to Beach 126th Street. It is taller, taking into account expected sea level rise. It is stronger, designed to withstand more, more better the, the force of the ocean. Uh, it is designed uh, to, as, a, as part of a multi-layered system of protection that will work in concert with the, pro with the projects that the Army Corps has proposed for the Atlantic shoreline to provide uh, a level of protection on Rockaway Beach that we've never had before. However, uh, it will not prevent erosion from occurring at Rockaway Beach. Erosion will continue. The Army Corps project will substantially reduce the rate of erosion, but they specifically in their, pl in their plan identify the need for periodic replenishments on a four-year cycle in order to maintain the width of the beach at the level uh, to which it is designed. And that is, that is a really crucial point uh, for people to understand. Uh, for years, uh, we have experienced erosion on Rockaway Beach. Uh, we did not have in place the federal authorization or appropriation to restore those beaches. And it was a, an enormous challenge uh, to get both the congressional authority and the funding needed to do the periodic restorations that are needed to maintain the beach uh, at a design level that provides both recreational beaches and protection to the public. And uh, I can't stress enough how important it is uh, for all of us in New York City to keep that in mind as we plan for the future of our shoreline, that we do need ongoing federal support to make sure that the beaches that we're rebuilding now will last for the full 50-year period intended in the Army Corps' design. Uh, we are aware that uh, beach, beach erosion has been uh, an issue in, in Rockways, particularly this season, as we've experienced higher tides than normal. Uh, the recently competed Rockway Boardwalk provides significant protection against coastal flooding uh, in the area, and it sets a global standard for resilient shoreline design while providing the Rockaway community with a beautiful, functional, uh, beachfront recreational amenity. Uh, the boardwalk is being integrated into a multi-level system of coastal protection that will reduce future events and account for the long-term effects of climate change. Early this year, the Army Corps uh, continued its beach renourishment efforts in the area, dredging the East Rockaway Inlet and placing clean sand at, uh, on Rockaway Beach from Beach 27th Street to Beach 38th Street. This is a periodic maintenance dredging that occurs in the East Rockaway Inlet. Uh, the Beach 30s are, are one of the hot spots in Rockaway, which traditionally erodes uh, more quickly than other parts of the beach, and we were uh, very uh, fortunate that the Corps was able to direct that sand onto the beach at no cost to the city. Uh, it was a, an enormous help to us, and we will continue to work with the Corps to identify opportunities uh, to address hot spots 
spots as they emerge uh, on Rockaway and in other places. And we will also be uh, wor working with uh, uh, the Clean Soil Bank that Curtis mentioned in his uh, testimony to look for opportunities to bring clean sand, appropriate sand, onto the beach uh, to address hot spots as they emerge uh, while uh, we uh, await for the Army Corps project to, uh, to rebuild the shoreline in Rockaway. On the uh, South shore of Staten Island, uh, the Tottenville Shoreline Protection Project aims to reduce wave action and coastal erosion through a revetment and beach renourishment, a team effort that is co-led by the Parks Department, uh, the Mayor's Office of Recovery and Resiliency, and the Governor's, Governor's Office of Storm Recovery. This work will address and complement the city's own raised shoreline erosion control proposal at, at Tottenville. The city and state are working towards an agreement to jointly fund uh, a project that addresses our shared priorities. The city has committed uh, $14.4 million uh, to supplement uh, the state's $9.3 million contribution. And New York City Parks is the lead agency managing this project, working closely with the governor's office, the Office of Recovery and Resiliency, and the design consultant. The associated offshore living breakwaters project is intended uh, to, uh, to control erosion over the long term. New York City Parks does not have a direct role in that project, uh, but does participate in joint briefings with the other agency partners. Working alongside the Mayor's Office of Recovery and Resiliency to address long-term resiliency issues facing New York City, Parks will continue to work uh, with the Corps of Engineers, the State Department of Environmental Conservation, uh, regarding uh, the, the, the possibility of bringing more sand to replenish the beaches of, Coney, of Rockaway and other, and other beaches. And New York City Parks will continue to administer and invest in our 14 miles of beaches, working with our state city and federal partners to maintain and enhance these wonderful settings for outdoor recreation uh, and to the benefit of local residents and visitors who come to our flock to our beaches every year. Thank you for allowing us to testify uh, before you today and for all of the great advocacy you do on behalf of parks and we'll be now happy to answer any questions you may have. All right, thank you gentlemen for that very um, thorough presentation. Uh, I'm gonna have a couple quick questions before we pass it on to my colleagues. Um, Mr. Ciora, you said that the cost for the Rockaways reconstruction is $4 billion, but that the funding is not in place. How much of that is in place? Uh, we anticipate approximately $400 million is available under the current Sandy Recovery Program. So you've got 10%, so and the words you used was that you would seek to implement portions of the project that are incrementally justified. What does that mean? Yes, sir. That's from an economic standpoint. We have to demonstrate that by building a component of the project that it could be a standalone feature that can, uh, the cost of the project cannot exceed the benefits that it produces. In this case, it would be coastal storm risk management benefits, uh, protection of, of uh, structures, infrastructure. So you might not even go forward with the whole project if the early phase, phases don't prove to be fruitful? Based on the analysis we've done to date, we are very confident that the Atlantic shorefront component of the project is economically justified. So the message to the people who live along that waterfront, and there are people who live there, it's, it's a residential neighborhood right up to the water, as I'm sure you know, is that... Um, that uh, while the money is not in place yet, you are confident that the Corps will proceed with the project as funds become available? Yes. And what yes. is the timeline for that? The current schedule is to complete the report by 2018. Uh, then it goes through our uh, higher headquarters approval process. Ultimately, it has to go to the Secretary of the Army's office. The Assistant Secretary of the Army for Civil Works needs to approve the recommended plan and uh, under the Sandy uh, legislation, uh, Public Law 113-2, we do not have to go back to Congress for authorization for those features of the project that are being constructed with the appropriated Sandy funding. So once the Secretary of the Army approves, we anticipate that being early 2019, we immediately proceed on to the detailed engineering design work, which we also have money for at full federal expense, and we anticipate that by the end of 2019, subject to us signing a project partnership agreement with the state of New York and, and the state in turn signing an agreement with the city of New York, we anticipate that we'll be in position to award the first construction contract. Okay, so the beach is already largely eroded. As I mentioned, at high tide, at least in Bell Harbor, 
the waves hit the boardwalk. So what I'm hearing from you is that there'll be no remediation to that for what if, if design will be conducted in 2019, construction begins thereafter. So uh, when when will this beach be restored to its rightful condition? Well, the full project will take a couple of years to complete. So it could be by the time we finish construction, we're probably closer to 2021 and 2022. Okay, this will so be a large project. Long way to go. I think at some point maybe we'll hear from parks about what we can do yes, to sir. shore this up and mitigate it in the meantime. Yes. You didn't mention it because it's not in New York City, but you're doing reconstruction work in Long Island as well. Yes, Long Island and New Jersey. How much are you spending in Long Island, for example? Um, well, Long Island in, to in to total projects? Sure. Uh, probably about $1.5 billion. The beaches in New York City are used uh, incredibly heavily. How are you determining which to prioritize um, Long Island versus the city? It, it's not really that we prioritize one project over the other. Uh, there were there was five, over $5 billion in Sandy recovery funds that were provided under the disaster relief package. Uh, really, it had to do with which projects were closer to construction. So, for instance, we have a large $200 million project in the city of Long Beach in Nassau County. That project was authorized for construction by Congress in 1996 and was basically on the shelf so, so, so for a long time. Five, so you said $5 billion total allocated for the region? Uh, for the entire North East, and basically. how much of that is allocated to New York City? Well, Rockaway, we found probably 1.2, 1.3 billion total. Okay, so a quarter, roughly. Yeah. Um, yeah. Seems yeah. like we represent more than a quarter of the uh, people affected by this weather incident. Uh, I understand that, sir. But what really, what we're we're constrained to existing projects. What what the, the Sandy Recovery Bill for the Corps of Engineers, unlike other agencies only funded ongoing projects. Uh, the New York, New Jersey Harbor and Tributary study that I mentioned at the completion of my testimony, that is a study that came out of Hurricane Sandy. That was not an ongoing effort right. prior to the storm event. And the funding that's being used for that study and ultimately for a project that's constructed will not be Sandy recovery funds. That would go through our normal federal appropriations process. So the Sandy recovery funds that we're using for the projects that were existing prior to Sandy, it, it, it didn't go by population. It really, you know, Long Island might have had six projects and New York City might have only had three. And, it, you know, that, that's how it was determined. Right, I'm going to pass it off to my co-chair, but it seems to me that when New York City was dead center of the target of the storm, uh, you look at the scale of the damage, the people affected, the people who live nearby, the number of people who use these beaches, that if we're only getting a quarter of the money, that doesn't seem fair to me. So I think we'd like to pursue that question. I'm going to pass it off to my chair, co-chair. Thank you, uh, Chair Levine. And, and I would just go a step further to say that even within the city of New York, no one could claim that there's pure equity about how we're spending resiliency dollars either. And, and I'm going to go uh, uh, into this issue now. I, I, in your testimony, and we've met again, Army Corps, I, I appreciate you being here again. Uh, but, but again, I'm going to raise some issues I raised with you last time, and I, and I just want, look forward to hearing your, your thoughts on this. Uh, again, we, we hear that in southern Brooklyn and Coney Island, we got 600,000 cubic yards of, of sand that uh, was lost after Superstorm Sandy. Um, when's the last time you've been down to Brighton Beach or Coney Island? Personally? Yes. About six months ago. Six months ago. Yeah. Uh, have you noticed the erosion? at the beaches? Uh, when I was there six months ago, I, I didn't notice any significant erosion, no, sir. Has the Parks Department noticed erosion at, at our beaches? Uh, we, we have not seen significant erosion at Coney Island or Brighton Beach. Right, well, Commissioner, uh, we have residents that live there uh, all year round. I uh, obviously li live in the community. Um, there is a lot of erosion happening as well. And, and I, again, I credit also my uh, friends from the Rockaways who have shared their photographs of what they're dealing with in their community too. There is a lot of erosion. Much of that sand, a lot of that sand is already gone. Um, and matter of fact, the sand keeps blowing around and, uh, you know, uh, <laughs> even onto the boardwalk, uh, a lot of the sand already has, if you 
take a good look at uh, from the boardwalk at the sand, it's almost becoming flat with the ocean. Uh, so people keep talking about the next Sandy. I'm just saying a nor'easter can be a major problem for our, our, our coastal community. Um, and just to get uh, clarification, um, d does both Army Corps and the city acknowledge that, you know, Coney Island in Brighton Beach is, is uh, from, what, from what I've heard and studied, is 14 feet higher, right, uh, as far as the, the, the elevation from sea level. Is that correct? I think the number is plus 13 is, is the number we commonly use. Yes. yes. Okay. Yes. Plus 13, almost 14. Um, yes. And do you acknowledge, does everyone here acknowledge that the ocean still came up over our barrier? Yes. During Superstorm Sandy? Yes. Right. So that's how significant Sandy was. Yes. Because yes. there is no question of the great sense of urgency in the Rockaways. It, it is, I mean, the, the photographs are very disturbing. Uh, but it's also alarming that we're known at, to be at higher elevation and we still got a significant storm surge that crossed over the beach, crossed over the boardwalk. That's, that's frightening. And I think that we need to also up the sense of urgency there as well. My colleague asked a question that I was going to ask, but I think uh, we have some more, more questions on this issue. You mentioned that of the $4 billion needed for the uh, Jamaica Bay uh, East Rockaway to Rockaway Inwood Jamaica Bay study, which includes Southern Brooklyn, uh, it's a $4 billion project of which you only have $400 million on hand. Is that correct? Approximately, yes. First of all, just to kind of tell my colleagues and, and the audience, uh, originally Southern Brooklyn was not even included in the study. And that includes my colleague, uh, Councilman Mizell from Canarsie, didn't include Canarsie either. It didn't include Sheepshead Bay. It didn't include Brighton Beach. It didn't include Gerritsen Beach. It didn't include Manhattan Beach. It didn't include Coney Island, Seagate, Gravesend Bay, Dyke Bay Ridge. It did not include these neighborhoods. So, we, so when you mentioned that you had studies on the shelf from 96 and towns of Long Island, we weren't even on the shelf. We were not even on a part, piece of furniture anywhere near a shelf. We were completely forgotten about. That's why we call ourselves the outer, outer forgotten borough. Um, but fortunately, we, through advocacy and some partnerships, we were included as part of the study. So we're, we're at step one when others are already at, at, at advanced steps. Now, what I am not hearing from anybody so far is what are the short-term measures? We know that, first of all, you only have a fraction of what's needed to implement uh, what these studies will will. Uh, ultimately uh, recommend, but what are, the, what are we doing in the short term? Uh, because we keep hearing, well, we'll try to see if we could put, patch up some sand, but the sand keeps eroding and the sand keeps blowing away. I haven't heard anyone talk about beach grass or other types of measures to retain sand from leaving. Has there been any discussion on that? I'm sorry, Council Member, I missed part of what you said. What are, what are the short-term measures in between waiting for these funds, which I'm going to get to also, what is the city's plan to get federal funding? Because we only have a fraction of what's needed. Uh, and we haven't heard any of our efforts to get funding from Congress. Uh, but what are the short-term measures? What are, what are the short-term goals to bolster our resiliency? Well, our, our short-term goal uh, in, in Coney Island specifically is to retain uh, the beach berm that we have in place now. And in fairness to the Army Corps, they did rebuild the Coney Island beach in the mid-90s. They raised it to the level of the 13 feet, which completely changed the, the sort of complexion of the boardwalk and the facilities it supported. Uh, and the city made a, a, a very large investment to uh, to keep the boardwalk and the beach functioning in the way it traditionally has. The berm that the Army Corps built in the mid-90s has, has, has performed remarkably well as a barrier. Yes, Superstorm Sandy overtopped it. Uh, there's no question about it. I don't know uh, what could have been done to prevent a storm of that magnitude from, uh, from overtopping a, a beach like Coney Island. But the Corps restored the beach very quickly after, this, after the storm, in our estimation, the beach is stable. We do periodic measurements, and we have not seen uh, significant loss of beach since then. We completely agree that there needs to be a long-term solution for that includes Coney Island, Brighton Beach, and all those other communities that you mentioned. And we were very glad when the Corps 
included them in their reformulation study for the entire coastline of Brooklyn and Queens. However, as I said earlier, it is in critically important that Congress authorizes the work that the Corps needs to do and appropriates money uh, to support the projects that are going to be needed to provide long-term protection to those communities. But, Commissioner, if you follow my logic, yes. if in the 90s they replenished the beaches in southern Brooklyn, Coney Island to 13 feet elevation, and th I guess there were studies saying that that would be sufficient, obviously you're saying those studies were wrong. I, I, I think for the... You know, Superstorm Sandy was an event the city has never experienced and we hope will never experience again. But over a 20-year period, the beach did stand up to the types of coastal storms that we typically experience in New York, including some that were fairly significant. There, there was one in 2010 that did a tremendous amount of damage at Plum Beach, just to the east of, of Coney Island and Brighton Beach. And fortunately, the Corps uh, was able to uh, develop a project fairly quickly to restore that beach, and it was restored just in time uh, uh, for Superstorm Sandy. And, and in fact, the, the Belt Parkway, we think, uh, was protected because because of the work the Corps did there. Uh, we, do, we don't disagree that we need to look at those beaches and include them in a comprehensive uh, plan. Right now, uh, the beach is... My state. point is, Commissioner, they were not included originally in a comprehensive yes, I, plan, I, I, and that's I, wrong, and we are so behind. As other areas are on the verge of breaking ground or having the money in place, and I, and I don't begrudge my colleagues, whether you're in Staten Island or, or parts of Queens where you have money in place already, I don't begrudge them. Good for them. They deserve it but my community is very much left behind. We are waiting from, we're at square one, and others are already at, at third base. That's what really pisses me off. And so, yes, I'm glad that we're now a part of a study, but we just hear study and study and study, and my community is facing another, as others here, a significant hurricane season, which we're hearing a projection of, of, of increased storm activity. And what do we tell them? Help is on the way when? We don't even have the money in place to help them right now. And I'm not hearing any short-term planning or short-term goals in between. I, I'm not hearing any of that. I also want to talk about, uh, first of all, uh, with regards to the $400 million in place now, you mentioned that in Mar March 8, 2018, there will be a report. Is that correct? Yes, sir. The, right. the final report. Correct. And what, what opportunities will the public from these impacted communities have to weigh in uh, on, this, on this report? Well, the draft report, as you know, sir, that was already released for public comment right. uh, last fall. So this really is just the, the finalization of some of the details of that plan. So it will go out again for a 30-day public uh, and agency review comment period next year. Because I just want to say that we still have not received 100 percent clarity, for example, in Coney Island Creek, for example, whether or not there will be a floodgate system or not. We know that they want to do something there but there's not 100% clarity in what exactly will be there. So when you say a final report, I just want to make sure the public still has a chance to weigh in on what exactly will be happening. Yes, we're, we're working on some of those details now as we approach the final report. But yeah, the, the draft plan did include a tidal gate across Coney Island Creek. That right, was so in the plan. I have two more quick questions. We'll turn over to my colleagues. I know that they've been very patient. Um, with regards to what are our efforts, uh, and I and I mean this, that, you know, Sandy was an unprecedented storm, and I fully understand that, but it's going to require an unprecedented amount of cooperation between local, state, and federal government to, to respond to it and to prepare for future storms. What are our efforts now underway in Congress with our, you know, Congress members, our senators, to secure funding to actualize these studies? Because obviously we don't have enough money. Can anyone speak to that? Well, speaking for the Corps of Engineers, and until we complete the report and submit it to Congress, they cannot take action because right now we don't have authorization for construction. That's the first step. We need the authorization from Congress and then followed by the federal appropriations. And then, of course, the remainder of the projects, being that they will not be constructed under the Sandy Recovery Program, most likely will require the normal cost sharing, which is 65 percent federal, 35 percent non-federal. Right, but you said you have an estimate of $4 billion to complete the, this entire East Rockaway to Jamaica Bay, right? That would be the entire plan, yes, sir. The, the entire plan, right. Yes. So when we speak to our senators and our Congress members, we want to ask them to help secure funding to actualize the plan. Yes. So we're short 
based on your math, right, what, what you're telling us, about $3.6 billion. Is Approximate, that correct? Approximately, yes. So that's what we need to know. You know, that's when we go to them and say we need, we need help. But uh, I, I want to hear from the highest levels of government, from City Hall and from the Parks Department, what are we doing? Are we working with our federal partners? Are we, is, this, is this a priority? Because there's an infrastructure package that's taking shape in Congress right now. Are we working to get a, a piece of it for, for these projects? Yes, we are in very close contact with the delegation. We are in regular communication on short term. We've been very concerned um, with all respect to the district who we work closely with that the, the, the um, Atlantic side has not separated out from the Jamaica Bay side and to, to really advocate strongly that the Atlantic side proceed without being delayed by the study of a tide barrier. But also on the larger unfunded $3.6 billion that you reference, yes, we are in constant um, communication with the delegation to look for opportunities on infrastructure funding in which we can position the city for coastal resiliency projects. And just you were, I, I, I plan to be meeting with City Hall and I appreciate their participation with uh, Congress members Hakeem Jeffries and Senator Schumer's office and also Congress member Dan Donovan as well to discuss uh, the much needed funding. Last question I have, I'll turn over to my colleagues. Um, I also have not heard about discussions with FEMA to make sure that these projects uh, will at, at least uh, align with their flood insurance mitigation uh, standards because obviously we want to protect life and property, there's no doubt about that, but we're also very much aware of FEMA's uh, reconfiguration of their flood zone maps of New York City, uh, which I do appreciate the city took a, a real, uh, Dan's really deserves a lot of credit on making sure that FEMA's get, trying to get it right, uh, but that's still a looming issue thousands of, if not more, will be impacted by these new flood maps. Um, and these projects have the potential to mitigate flood insurance costs for many New Yorkers. So is there discussions to make sure that they are aligning with the FEMA standards to mitigate and offset flood insurance costs? First. So uh, before answering that, I just want to say that the meeting I believe that we're having, that you're convening on June 28th, is exactly the kind of leadership and partnership that brings the city and the state and uh, our representatives together. And so I appreciate you that, and that's exactly what we need at this moment of time, is that uh, consistent advocacy and, and, and pressure. So thank you for that. Regarding FEMA, before turning it over to Anthony, um, we absolutely see coordination between the Army Corps project on Staten Island and FEMA uh, up to impute um, uh, for the floodplain and the insurance purposes. Uh, FEMA doesn't like to hear us refer to it for insurance benefit, uh, but we know that that's a practical outcome of it. We are in uh, conversations now actively regarding that project now that it's going into um, design, and that's the perfect time to do it. We're also doing it on East Side Coastal Resiliency with, with um, HUD and FEMA, so that as projects get to the point where we have the design uh, at a level of design and planning that it's ready to do that coordination for the certification that is, that is absolutely underway. Anthony, do you have? No, I mean, Curtis is exactly right. That we, we do engage with FEMA uh, at the appropriate point in the process when we have uh, an approved plan and have some more details in terms of the design to have those discussions. And we would continue those same discussions or uh, initiate those same cons cons discussions for the Rockaway project when we get to that point, the Rockaway Jamaica Bay project. Yes. Thank you very much. I'll turn over to my colleagues now. Okay, we're going to hear from Councilmember Ulrich, whose district covers many of the affected beaches. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mark and Mark, uh, both committees, uh, for holding this important hearing. I represent the district that was perhaps the most severely affected by Hurricane Sandy and the coastal erosion that has happened since. I have not heard from anybody at City Hall for the past year. I have not heard from anybody in the Mayor's office. I have not heard from anybody other than my friends in the Parks Department, like uh, Deputy Commissioner Kavanaugh and, uh, and also uh, 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 Dottie Lewandowski, about what the Mayor's office plans to do to combat the fact that my district is now more at risk today than they were prior to Hurricane Sandy. And so I would like to ask a few questions, but I also want to send a message to City Hall, and I want you to take this back to your higher-ups and the people that can do something about this. 
When Mayor de Blasio comes to Queens to bring City Hall to your borough, because he's done it in the Bronx and Staten Island, he better be bringing a few cubic yards of sand with him and better be reforming Build the Back, because when he comes to Rockaway in my district, he will not be welcome in that part of Queens County. And he still has to be a mayor for my constituents. Whether or not they like him, they vote for him, they agree with him, the ocean is eating up the sand and the beach in my district, and the homeowners, many of whom are still not in their homes, are at more risk today than they were the day before Hurricane Sandy. And so please relay that message. I would like a phone call from the deputy mayor or from the mayor himself. I'll be very nice to him, I promise. But I have not heard a damn thing from anybody on the other side of City Hall about what they are going to do to speed up sand replenishment, bring rock jetties or groins or some long-term measure to curtail the erosion that's happening out there. I believe that they are allowing my district to disappear. I think that there's a map of the city in the mayor's office, and the legend for the map is over the Rockaways. It's almost like we don't exist. And so we hear about studies and funding and hearings and all of these testimonies that we hear. What are we doing? We have this 90-day report. Is it going to be made available to the public? Are the elected officials going to be briefed? By the way, it's not for me to speak for my fellow elected officials in my part of Queens, but when I talk to them, and I talk to them on a very regular basis, my assembly person, my state senator, they have not heard anything from the mayor's office. So I'm glad that the mayor's office came here today to announce that you know, they're going to be working with the Parks Department and the Army Corps, and we're going to come up with short-term, long-term, 90-day study. This is all news to me. So I want to know what we're going to do after those studies and those assessment periods are completed. I want to know who is going to be in touch with my office and the community board and the local uh, civics and the people that have been begging, begging for attention, for respect, for sand, for common decency, communication between them and City Hall. Zero. I'm telling you, I can't wait till the mayor comes to Queens. I'm going to be out there with a sign on the boardwalk, and it ain't going to be pretty. So I hope he has a good announcement. I'll praise him. I'll thank him. I'm not going to support him. I'm not voting for the guy, but I will give credit when credit is due. Right now, if I had to grade the city's response to the beach erosion and Hurricane Sandy recovery, F, zero, terrible job, absolutely disgraceful. That is my assessment. And I don't need 90 days to do a study to give you that. No, that's not for applause. It's, uh, it just happens to be. Let me ask a few questions. This 90-day study or says, could, Survey. Survey, thank you, survey. What takes you 90 days, I could do in 90 minutes. I could take you to Rockaway right now. It'd probably take 90 minutes to get there. But uh, I could take you there. We'll take the ferry. By the way, thank you for the ferry, but it never should have been taken away to begin with. I skipped that press conference. That was another dog and pony show. I'm going to thank the mayor for giving me something that he should have never took away. That's a, a, a topic for another hearing, number one. Number two, when this 90-day survey is completed, what is the rollout of the findings? What, what, what is the process? Walk me through. And, and by the way, when is that 90th day approaching? What is the day? What is the 90th day? Uh, well, we're going to start uh, the procurement on the on-call consultant uh, probably Tuesday of next week. Okay. So Tuesday of next week, we're going to hire a consultant, or we're going to start the, the process. procurement process. All right. So it's going to take more than 90 days. Let's be clear. N no. All right. Well, you're going to hire a consultant like to find out who that consultant is, but that's another story. We're going to hire a consultant to do a 90-day survey. When do we anticipate that 90-day starting, that 90-day period? When, how long will it take you to hire the consultant? We believe we could complete the surveying and then the analysis of the survey data in 90 days. Okay, but, that is our commitment. But give me a date. Tell me September 1st the survey starts, August 1st, October 1st. Tell me when I can expect the survey to start and when can I expect it to finish. That's what I'd like to know. 
I can tell you we will complete it in 90 days. I cannot tell you the day we will be on the beach with the surveyors. Okay, can, can you tell me the month when you're going to start the survey? Can you tell me the, 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 the season of the year that you're going to start? Is it going to start in the summer? Is it going to start in the fall? Are we going to see the Christmas? When is this going to happen? Go. Please. Uh, we expect to begin the actual survey week, survey work on the beach by the middle of July, and we expect to have the analysis completed thank you. by the middle of thank September. You. That's, 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 thank you, Commissioner. Thank you very and much. And I, I do want to say it, it is an important step that, that, that right. Curtis outlined in his testimony. We see the erosion. We're not blind. We, we know where it's right. occurring. Uh, it's important that we quantify the amount that has been lost since the beach was restored by the Army Corps. We have the as-built drawings. We've just completed another uh, analysis, uh, a LIDAR analysis, as Curtis mentioned, that all goes into uh, a Assessing how much has been lost and where we need to invest whatever we can find to restore those, those beaches. And, and thank you, Commissioner, and thank God for people like you, like Dottie, like Portia, because if it wasn't for them, I wouldn't know anything. Thank God I come to these hearings and I actually read the reports because I wouldn't know about work the city wants to do in my district otherwise. So when we have this, this survey completed, thank you for that answer. It's honest and I appreciate it. When it is completed after 90 days, are they going to propose recommendations for action? Are they going to identify sources of funding to do those things? What do we hope to get? What is our hypothesis for this survey? What are we trying to study, and what do we want to get from this study? Uh, we, we are going to be studying the loss of sand in specific areas, how much is lost, and how much is needed to restore it and prevent uh, more erosion into the dunes that were created uh, by the Army Corps after the storm. Okay. And we, we will prioritize areas based on the results uh, of, the, of that analysis. And as I said, we are going to be looking for opportunities to bring more sand to the beach. Right. Uh, we have the, uh, the, the Clean Soil Bank, which uh, we which we know will be generating sand, whether it is beach quality uh, and, and how, how, how difficult it is to get there, that's one of the potential sources. If other dredges uh, occur within the harbor that can be directed to the beaches in Rockaway, we'll be doing that as well. We've done it before with the Army Corps on several occasions. It's been very, uh, very, very helpful to us to have that, uh, but I can't specifically say we have a dredge lined up for this period to, to deliver that much sand to the that, beach, but that's what we're going to Thank continue you. to pursue. Thank you. That, that's fine. So, and I accept that, and that's a very honest answer, and I appreciate that. Will the survey or study look at other mitigation measures such as rock jetties, groins, and other things that are more permanent to prevent erosion in the future? Will that be part of the survey? Uh, no, it will not be part of the survey. The Corps has done that as part of their reformulation right. study. They have what we think is, is a very sound plan for the Atlantic shoreline that does include 13 new groins as well as, 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 as rebuilding five existing groins. Right. It, as I said earlier, it will not prevent erosion from occurring. It will slow the rate of erosion substantially over what we are seeing today. Is there funding in place for the groins, for the rock jetties? And when do we expect that to take place? Or when can we expect that to start, the process? Right. That would be part of the features of the overall Rockaway Jamaica Bay plan right. that I mentioned earlier that right. we do expect to be funded under the Sandy Recovery Program Wonderful. and could start as early as uh, 2019, late Th 2019. Thank, and, thank and can, you. Yeah, we, we, since we have other waiting to ask questions, can we yep, get back to you? You know what? I will, I will yield whatever time. I don't have any time left, but I will yield the microphone back to the chairs. I want to thank you for your indulgence. This is a very important yes. hearing. I know it yeah. doesn't. this issue doesn't affect every district in the city but it absolutely affects mine. I know Councilmember Richards' district is also severely affected by beach erosion, and I'm very passionate because I'm here to fight for my constituents like everybody else, and I don't appreciate it when I'm ignored. And when the mayor's office comes to the city council and tells us that they've got a great grandmaster plan and they don't keep anybody in the loop, very disrespectful. Unappreciated. We take ex total exception to that. We've been in the Queens and in your district constantly. Really? We were at CB14 yeah. on Tuesday night, and my colleagues that are right. with me here today, we've been out in Breezy. Right. We're in constant contact, so that is actually a factually incorrect statement right. on your part. Facts. You want to talk about facts. We'll have another hearing on facts, and I'll rip you and the mayor to shreds any day, any time. Right. Have a nice day. Thank you, Council Member. Okay. Our public advocate, Tish James. Did you have questions? Do I want to go after that? <laughs> <laughs>
So let me just follow up um, from some of the questions by Councilmember Ulrich. Um, in the event that the federal government does not come forward with additional resources, is the city prepared um, to stand in the breach? If the federal government, for whatever reason, decides not to go forward with this resiliency program because everything is anticipated and nothing has been confirmed, correct, Mr. Sierra? Yeah, at this point, until the report is approved, right? right. With, so, our, our assumption is that we're going to have you know, positive recommendations that are supported by our non-federal partners, and we will receive the higher authority approval that we're seeking so that we can proceed on to the next phase. Are you confident that we will receive um, the $400 million, uh, all of the $4 billion, which is the entire cost of the project for the Rockaways? I am confident that we will receive the Sandy Recovery Funding that we need to build those components that I mentioned earlier that are economically justified, uh, approximately $400 million, yes. Approximately four. Yes. And the $400 million exactly will go for what particular project on the Rockaway Peninsula? It would include the Atlantic shorefront component of the Rockaway Peninsula, including the, the new groins, the rehabilitation of the existing groins, uh, the reinforced dune, uh, beach replenishment. Uh, it would also, we're looking at uh, on the back bay side, identifying some high frequency risk reduction areas and along you, the back bay. And can you give me the geographic, um, uh, the geography? Where exactly are we talking on the peninsula? On the Atlantic shorefront, we're talking approximately from Beach 9th to Beach 149th Street. Yes. Did I get that right? Okay. And then on the back bay, it's different sites along both the uh, Rockaway Peninsula Bay side as well as also along the Queens and Brooklyn mainland, certain sites. And that $400 million will be in the upcoming federal budget, which we anticipate will be? No, I'm sorry, ma'am. Okay. The $400 million is previously appropriated funds from 2013 under the Disaster Relief Appropriations Act. Those funds are already in place. Okay, so it's just awaiting your report? C yes, correct. Okay, thank you for that. Two, the 90-day survey will not include um, rock jetties, uh, baffle walls, berm reinforcement, V-shaped reefs, or any of that. Is that, what I is that what I just heard? Yes. And why is that? We're focusing on the areas that have eroded severely. Um, you know, there are some, some very serious erosion issues in Rockaway. However, the entire beach is not eroding substantially. When the Corps rebuilt the beach after Hurricane Sandy, uh, they established a, an elevation on the beach through a series of dunes that was almost twice as high as the traditional elevation of the beach. Uh, that dune system is largely intact throughout most of Rockaway, except in some very specific areas where we see very serious erosion. And we, we're out there every day, we see it ourselves, we talk to the people on the beach, we know the concerns around that area. We want to focus on those areas, develop some short-term mitigation strategies for those specific places, uh, because we do expect that the project that the Army Corps will build, and we're, we're very confident that's going to happen, uh, will in the long term provide a level of protection for Rockaway Beach that we've never seen before. And can you just, just define or explain what those mitigation efforts are exactly? Primarily the mitigation efforts are going to be bringing more sand to specific areas to try to rebuild the profile that was established by the Corps during their replenishment program after Sandy. But sand alone does not ensure resiliency. No, it, do, it does not. It's a short-term measure uh, to protect the, the upland features uh, that, uh, you know, that are and short, adjacent to the beach. And short-term anticipation of the Army Corps of Engineers stepping in. And in the event that the Army Corps, for whatever reason, in the event that it's not funded, given the politics of the day, is the city prepared to step in and... I, I, I could not commit the city to specific actions if, you know, the unthinkable happens and the Army Corps project doesn't materialize, the city would have to consider options to add additional protections to the beach. And in this budget that was just passed last week, is there additional resources in the budget in the city of New York for resiliency? I have to defer to Curtis on that question. Yes, we can get you that list um, uh, that ORR and our partner agencies on resiliency projects. But if I'm uh, taking your question, there are there was not funding for sand per se. Okay. 
Thank you. And my last question, because I know others have to speak and we've got other witnesses. This June 28th meeting um, that you um, mentioned, um, someone mentioned, June 28th meeting, is that with the federal delegation and the members of the city council? Or who's convening that meeting? What is the purpose of that meeting? I, is that meeting primarily for Coney Island? I, I could answer that to public advocate. Uh, this is a meeting at the request of my office to find out where Southern Brooklyn stands in all this equation, because we were completely left behind, as I noted in my earlier testimony. So I'm just finding out if uh, making sure that this is we're on the radar. But the funding that we're fighting for includes um, the $4 billion for the entire Jamaica Bay study. So it's beyond Southern Brooklyn, and it extends through a big portion of the city of New York. Thank you, Council Member. Sure. Um, so, and your office I'm is sorry. definitely welcome to attend. Thank you. If I could amplify, yeah. um, I believe also we have been in touch with the delegation, and Anthony, perhaps you can confirm this, but the de delegation specifically has requested a meeting with the Army Corps regarding the Atlantic shoreline and the new timetable uh, related to that. Uh, has that been scheduled? And is that meeting scheduled? Thank you. <laughs> yeah, that, that's correct, Chris. Yeah, uh, Senator Schumer's office is uh, leading a meeting uh, amongst the uh, congressional offices to discuss the, the status of the overall Excellent. Rockaway Inlet to Rockaway Inlet and Jamaica Bay study, including the West. Do we uh, have a date West for that meeting? Do you know? Um, I don't know if we've decided on a date yet. It's sometime next week. Um, have a date? Okay. We, we provide the list of dates that were available. I think we're just waiting confirmation okay. from, we'll from the Congress. we'll reach out to the Senator. Thank you. Yeah. I appreciate it. Thank you, Madam Public Advocate. Now we'll go to Councilmember Cohen, followed by Councilmember Richards. Uh, thank you, Chairs. Uh, as the council member representing the highest natural point in the city of New York, uh, I'll defer to council member Richards and will come back to me. How kind generous of you. But he's also always has a passport for the Rockaways. We love you out in Rockaway. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Chairs, for holding this hearing. Uh, just a few questions, and I want to thank um, the administration because you have at least with my office, uh, done a layman's job in really communicating with us, and we, we truly appreciate it. Um, we know there's still a lot more work that needs to be done to make sure, uh, especially I think in light of the reports that we've seen over the last few weeks, that it's going to be a very busy hurricane season uh, around the world. And in, in one sense, it's even more imperative that this conversation is happening now. Um, and I can tell you, you know, the amount of anxiety that when people hear you know, uh, those words, how much it picks up in our community. So I, I thank you and hope we continue to work seriously to ensure that uh, our communities are more resilient and sustainable. A uh, question for Army Corps. So we raised, I know we're talking about beach erosion and studies, and, and that's good. Um, I meant the biggest concern I've heard is around the bay, um, because for my residents, we were really hit hard. Uh, by the Bayside as well. So I know you, you skimmed over some potential projects, um, some areas you're focusing on. Uh, is Arvern one of those areas? Yes, that's one of the potential areas we're looking at. All right, so that's one potential one area. And, and, and can you give me a, a, a guesstimated time of, of when you anticipate any work happening on the Bayside there? And I know there was also, and I don't know if we can speak to this today, some leftover boardwalk money as well. Uh, and I think if I'm, if you're ready to speak to that, uh, is there potential for that money to be used in Arvern and both along Edgemere and Bayswater, those portions of the peninsula? Yeah, to ensure. So where are we actually at in that process? Um, I know that the city has submitted um, some projects with some leftover funding. So I'm interested in hearing uh, how much money is it, and I believe it's $120 million, and where are we at with that? Thank you, Councilmember Richards. And to your question, public advocate, that regarding short-term measures on the Rockaways, yes, the, uh, we're very pleased that Parks and the Economic Development Corporation were able to del deliver the uh, boardwalk project um, uh, on time and under budget. Only because of Rockaway residents' pressure. There you go. Okay. <laughs> Whatever gets the job done. Uh, and so uh, we do have an underrun of uh, $120 million, and in the FEMA 428 pilot program, it allows the city to um, reprogram that fu those funds for other resiliency projects. The mayor has made the commitment that, that those underrun funds will stay in 
the Rockaways, and in fact, the, the mayor's office, in, in collaboration with the Parks Department, has submitted to FEMA applications for specific projects that, um, that are in excess of the $120 million, and that application has been received and is being reviewed, and we look forward to shortly hearing from FEMA that these projects can, in fact, move ahead with that $120 million, and those will be both Bay and Atlantic side um, amenity projects, yes. And Can you speak to that as well, U.S. And, Army? And just specifically, it does include coastal resiliency projects at Bayswater, Edgemere, and Rockaway Community Park. Okay. Resiliency. They're both amenity and resiliency. They um, must, they have, they, excuse me, so they have to have resiliency. Some of them are related to amenities. Councilman, I think one of your questions was directed to, to the Army Corps. So let me, uh, in regards to the Sorry, time, no, I hopped the around. timing. So we will be working closely, obviously, with our partners uh, at the state and the city on the, the sites that we're going to be considering around the bay. And again, that's not just along the Rockaway Peninsula Bay Shore, but as well as the mainland of Queens and Brooklyn as well, Howard Beach, Canarsie, th those communities. Uh, but the timeline is the same as the, the remainder of So of the 2019. Uh, 2019, yeah, the, the report would be finalized in 18, would go through our approval process by early 2019, and then we'd move into detailed design. So when will we see shovels in the ground? Well, what the we community? haven't determined yet, sir, is where we're going to start. Obviously, we want to be underway as soon as possible, but it, it is possible, depending on, uh, you know, uh, permits, approvals, or real estate acquisition that we could start at a Bayside site. Or, you know, maybe, maybe the design is simpler there. And uh, we're going to try to start as soon as possible, and, and it's not going to be sequential. We're going we're to work concurrently because the oceanfront project should not be impacted by what we're doing on the Bayside. Different type of work, different contractors. So maybe it could be late 19, early 2020 that we're starting both on the bay side and the ocean front, or maybe it is that we're starting on the bay side first. We haven't gotten to those discussions, to those details yet, but we will in the next year or so. Okay, and I'll just put this as I, as I close out uh, because we've obviously had a lot of conversations around this. Um, so just, understand, though, so the, the approval, yeah. it's one approval for the, for the, for the overall project. project. Yeah. Okay. So just in terms of, and I represent 70% of the Rockaways, and I, and I truly do believe that all of the Rockaways uh, should be serviced uh, in an equitable fashion and want to make sure that, you know, I put out there, you know, uh, you know, the Rockaways is a very long stretch. Um, the, a lot of mile, mileage, uh, mile lanes of beach and bay, and I just want to make sure that I'm clear uh, with the Army Corps that we are truly looking at, and, and I don't know if there's ways to work through this, but to make sure that, you know, protective features are being uh, distributed in timelines for both sides in an equitable uh, fashion because, you know, in, in all honesty, I represent 70% of the Rockaways. Um, uh, you know, 75% of the residents in my area are, low in, uh, are, are, are you know, uh, middle income, low income New Yorkers who really do not have the means in the event of a storm. And none of us do. So I don't, I want to get past that, but I just want to make sure that I put on the record that, you know, we're going to be looking to hear a lot more about how we can have dual starts. So if you're going to start on 149th, I mean, one, one, 120s or wherever you're going to start, is it possible and feasible for you to also start in the 60s at the same time rather than working your way all the way down the bay and getting to the eastern end in 2025. Right. Again, I, I don't see why we would have to construct this project sequentially in that sense, because uh, even though it's one full system, uh, the nature of the work is, is different enough that we could work them in. And again, uh, I acknowledge in your, your concern, sir, we do work very closely with our congressional delegation, uh, Congressman Gregory Meeks, Congressman Hakeem Jeffries, Personally, uh, both of them are personally engaged Great. With, awesome. with my office. We mm -hmm. briefed them in their Washington office. We've gone to their town halls. So, you know, obviously they, they share your concerns. Okay, great. Thank you. Look forward to continuing to work together. All right. Now, Councilmember Cohen. Uh, thank you, Chairs. Um, uh, from the time I was an infant until I went to college, I lived in the Rockaway, so I, I do have a, a and, and I go out there regularly now, so I, I care about the community. Uh, greatly, and I, I guess I, I'm a little concerned. Uh, and while I can't say it with the same flair that uh, my colleague who represents the area said it, it sounds like that the Parks Department is acknowledging that there are pockets of serious erosion, which I which I've, I've seen um, 
uh, and that we don't, and we're, as we're now entering hurricane season, there's really no plan to do anything in the interim that for the next, at least the next six months or, and at the rate the city operates, you know, maybe as long as a year, there's nothing to do in the interim to try to protect the, those areas where there is really significant erosion where, you know, you built dunes and now the tide is up to the dunes. Uh, so all that work is going to be lost if we don't do something in the interim to protect them. So I'm curious if, I, if I'm understanding uh, your testimony correctly. Uh, Council Member, I, I, I can't commit to, to taking any, any interim measures right now that will restore uh, the beach in the most severely eroded area. But I do need to point out that the beach is very different than it was prior to Hurricane Sandy. The elevated dune that was created after the storm, thanks to the Army Corps' work, is a substantial layer of protection that is largely intact. Uh, it is protected except for the access points uh, by snow fencing. It's planted with dune grass. It is- Commissioner, uh, the, the fencing is, is completely gone as far as I could tell. I, I'm, I'm not sure that the Parks yeah. Department has, you know, has got to maintain these dunes and maintain the work that's been done. Otherwise, you know, and like I said, I, I've witnessed where the, the, the tide is right up to the, to the, the base of the dunes. And, but in addition, in the most severely eroded area, we do have the new boardwalk, uh, which has a substantial amount of sand underneath it and has a sand retaining wall behind it, uh, which wasn't there before the storm. Uh, so while I absolutely understand the concern about the erosion that people are seeing, we are in better shape uh, than we were prior to Hurricane Sandy. I, 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 I would readily concede that. I think that the work that the, the boardwalk is incredible. Um, no, no one's mentioned it, but the, 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 the barrier wall between the beach and the neighborhood is, is in, incredibly impressive. And I've observed that the, the gates are being used. In, in, so I, I don't think that anybody can take that away from you. But there are some people who are going to be, you know, who are, you know, in the, as you pointed out, in, in the 130s and the 140s, where there really is significant erosion. I mean, those people are very vulnerable to flooding again from, I think, a storm significantly less than Sandy just because there's so little beach left. And like I said, I, I see the dune er eroding, you know, right before my eyes. And, and, and the Parks Department has put in a significant amount of effort to create these dunes, uh, but I do think that th there is a requirement of maintenance of the dunes. Uh, as I did point out, I don't believe there's any fencing left, at least from the boardwalk to 140th. I don't think there's a stick of fence left protecting those dunes anymore. And the beaches are so heavily used, if people start walking through those dunes, they will also cause damage there. So mm -hmm. I think there needs to be a commitment there to maintain that work. I agree, and I will look at it personally. Thank you. Thank you, colleagues, and thank you, panel. Well, actually, I do have... Forgive me. Go ahead. Yeah. Just wanted to quickly follow up on one item. Please allow me to just read a small portion, a portion of testimony from a person who could not make it here today but wanted to express her concerns on behalf of the shoreline in Southern Brooklyn. We've heard a lot about the Rockaways, which is absolutely uh, needed and vital and urgent, but I just want to just counter to some of the stuff I heard earlier about our shoreline. It could be years, even decades, before a flood protection plan is developed, finalized, and funded. No flood protection uh, system, no matter how carefully designed, is infallible but any flood protection is better than no flood protection at all. The beaches of southern Brooklyn are the only protection against flooding that we currently have, and they are being neglected to the point that even a Category 1 hurricane will flood local streets. A small sand replenishment that was done after Sandy has been lost to erosion. Jetties that were buried in a major beach replenishment project in the 90s are now exposed. High tides on a full moon or new moon used to end about halfway up the jetties. Now they frequently extend 75 feet or more past them. One of the nor'easters we had this past winter brought the ocean more than halfway up the beach. With all of the erosion that we have had these past few years, it won't take much longer for a storm surge to go over the boardwalk and flood our communities again. It is difficult to stop shoreline erosion, but in Brooklyn's Brighton Beach and Coney Island, beaches are eroding uh, even on, uh, on the street-facing borders. It is unbelievable that this is allowed to continue uh, every year. And every year, the wind blows tons of sand off the beach and onto the boardwalk. The boardwalk sand piles can become several inches high before the wind scatters the sand onto local streets or the rain washes the sand into storm drains. As a result, the beach profile becomes lower every year and the likelihood that a storm surge will come over the beach and local streets increases. Again, the only thing we have is the beach. The most infuri and this is the last part I'll read. The most infuriating thing 
is that it won't take rocket science to keep the sand from eroding over the boardwalk. Vegetation, beach grass, would not only minimize sand migration onto the boardwalk, but it would also provide a- attenuation of storm surge waves, especially if there were dunes. Vegetated sand dunes are a proven, easily constructed, cost-effective way to provide some shoreline protection. New Jersey towns that had high sand dunes with vegetation survived Sandy relatively unscathed. Communities without them were obliterated. But there are no uh, vegetated sand dunes on Brooklyn's public beaches. Every year, some beach grass begins to grow, but instead of allowing it to grow and hold the sand in place, the Parks Department digs it right up. No distinction is made between beach grass and weeds. And so they go on to go on about the importance of, of, of this beach grass. Are there efforts underway? Because we keep hearing about dunes that have not been maintained. The wind blows them away. We, we also saw in cases in Staten Island where some folks uh, decided to take their four-wheelers and play games on them. Uh, are we looking at beach grass in, in New York City, for New York City beaches, as a short-term measure before these studies and funds come in place? Yes, we have used beach grass extensively on Staten Island beaches, on the Rockaway beaches, and we can look at adding beach grass to Coney Island and Brighton Beach. Right, and so uh, do you agree that if beach grass is planted in addition coupled with these dunes or berms that they minimize I'm not saying they perfectly prevent uh, erosion or pre- prevent full uh, disappearance of the sand, but does it minimize, to some extent, the impact uh, of the wind b- blowing the sand away? It does stabilize the sand. It doesn't prevent it, of course, you know, blowing and things like that, but it does stabilize the sand. We, we agree it's a beneficial element on our coastal beaches. Are there, is there a shortage of beach grass? The last time I checked, there was. Is it available? Uh, immediately following Hurricane Sandy, there was a shortage. Communities all over the Northeast uh, were looking for uh, that specific type of grass. Uh, I don't think there is a shortage now, however. I think the industry has, has uh, sort of recovered and responded. Is it very demand. expensive, Commissioner? It's not very expensive. So wh- why aren't we doing more just to get it to at least minimize to some extent before these studies and other funds come our way? Typically, uh, you know, Coney Island and Brighton Beach uh, have a uh, uh, sort of a different uh, use pattern than many of the beaches that we well, operate. Even in the case of the Rockaways, I, I don't, I'm not sure if they would, uh, again, I, I, forgive me, I have not been there in a, in a while, and I have to pay a visit there. Uh, but it, it, yes, uh, hopefully I have my uh, <laughs> best beach uh, east, east of Coney Island, yes. Uh, <laughs> but uh, just as a, as a short-term measure, before everything else takes shape, and hopefully, as the public advocate rightly points out, we might not get this federal money, which would be devastating, devastating. And I have, I have, I have a message for our federal partners beyond our delegation. Whether you live in the Rockaways or Coney Island or whether you live in New Orleans or Miami, we're, we're all facing the same rising threat. Mm -hmm. So this should not be a partisan issue. This should not be a Democrat-Republican issue. We're all Americans facing the same enormous growing threat. And so I really hope that Congress does not politicize this very urgent issue that affects blue states and red states, all states. Uh, But why isn't it being considered as just a short-term measure if you're saying it's not expensive and it is available? I think it had to do with the tr- traditional nature of the beach at Coney Island. Is a, 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 it, it has intense use that goes from the boardwalk right down to the shoreline. Uh, and one of the things you have to do to make the grass be effective is to prevent people from walking on it, through it, or uh, having any contact with it. Uh, I, I, there are probably some areas in Coney Island where we could not install the grass uh, and expect it to survive, but there are other areas where I think it could be effective and we will definitely look at that and let you know what our plans are. Did that, did that apply to the Rockaways as well? Yes. Because that's something that could be a short-term measure for now. I'm not saying this is the, this is not the end all, but this yes. is something in, in the meantime. Okay, uh, thank you very much. 
Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you to our panel. Appreciate your testimony. We're going to call up our second panel, which includes Hank Yori, John Signorelli, Nicholas de Blasi, and John Corey. And Sergeant, if you could put a, we're, because we're short on time, we're going to have a three minute clock for each testimony. Do you hear me? Okay. Yeah, good evening. Uh, good afternoon. Um, thanks for having this. This is finally about time. Mark, you did an amazing job last night at the, uh, the hearing last night. I'll build it back. Thank you. Um, you guys obviously see now in your packet that I gave out the erosion that's a topic of discussion. It's pretty evident that stone groins from in the beach 30s down to the 80s in the Rockaway Peninsula work very well. Um, the sand after the Army Corps of Punishment was along this line. This is how much we've lost. And um, this is just kind of a before and after image of one beach, 92nd Street, the beach I live on. and. Um, this is an after picture of how much sand loss we have. And this is where thousands and thousands of people, just like Coney Island, Mark, sit on the beach and are stuck blanket to blanket, really not having a great time. Uh, the big issue right now is obviously they planted a dune. The dune is failing. Um, you can see on the third page or fourth page um, uh, to this gentleman, uh, Cohen, uh, Councilman Cohen, you po pointed out about the failing dune. It's, it's sand. It's not stone. We need stone groin uh, to keep the, the sand in place to keep, to really protect our homes right now, especially with the idea of a stone groin only going to uh, 122nd Street. They need to go well beyond into the whole residential area. Um, the Army Corps knows this. Uh, it's just a matter of funding. We need to really get this pushed. You guys are doing a great job. Um, let me just talk about one thing really fast. Beach grass. You do not want beach grass. Councilman, uh, um, um, Richard's district has lost one mile of usable beach. No one can go on it because once you plant beach grass, the beach amaranth, a plant, will grow. That is an endangered species, the plant itself. Then the piping plover lands. You will lose all that beach. That happens in Breezy Point. It happens a lot on the Jersey Shore. Very important thing. Be careful what you wish for, Mark. It's very, very serious. Um, but the most important thing we really got to consider is the short term, obviously, it's great that hopefully we come up with this great plan and put sand in the hot spots in the beach 30s and the beach 90s. But it's very critical that whoever pays for it, stone groins work. You know, beach dunes do not work anywhere. They talk about uh, along the Jersey Shore. You, um, you point that out. The problem with that is Everywhere you look that had these great uh, success stories of preventing sand uh, I'm sorry, waves from coming into communities, like the, the Christmas tree and dunes in the Jersey Shore, if you look at Google Earth, every one of them, Long Beach, they all had stone groins. That is the end all be all on the, on the Long Island seashore as far as protect, keeping the beach in place. Because when you have storms, storms want to eat something. They want to eat your homes, your boardwalks. Let them eat the sand first. The waves break on the sand and they'll come in a gentle slide into the dune and obviously works. And the, and the Corps has obviously suggested that for a very small portion of the Rockway Peninsula. They need to go into, but well, these gentlemen are from, from Bell Harbor, the, uh, which is an area from like 122nd to 149th Street. It's very important that that, that is, the city pushes the Army Corps to put stone groins all the way through, all the way through to Reeves Park, all the way through to uh, the most eastern, uh, western part of Coney Island, Mark. I mean, it's very important. Thank you. Uh uh, thank you for having me. My name is John Signorelli. I'm a VP of the Bell Harbor Property Association. Uh, I just want to make one comment that I heard often was replenishment of the sand. I don't take that personally as a mitigation effort. Mitigation is to prevent the sand from remo being removed or disappearing. So there's a distinction there in how to use the word mitigation. Uh, I want to talk about uh, accessibility. Uh, the City of New York Parks and Recreation proposed a phase six plan to build a five 
American Disability Act ramps and two vehicle ramps within the Rockway Park, Bell Harbor, and the Ponza communities that did not go forward on November 25, 2015. Reasons given uh, were rejected by the city proposal was the need to soon revisit the berm issue with the Army Corps of Engineers for their major berm reconstruction, design intrusiveness with beach property owners, walkway design objections, and waste, uh, potential waste of tax dollars due to the Army Corps berm rebuild in the near future. Um, the Bell Harbor Property Owners Association new comprehensive ideas for safety, mobility, and visual excellence uh, is by this uh, design that was uh, submitted to the Army Corps and to the parks and others uh, for the ADA accessibility with ramps. Uh, I'd like to submit this into the uh, membership. Uh, the shown multifunction design uses the highest aesthetic standards and seamless approach to the uh, Army Corps review. It's believed the Rockaway communities and government representatives can find the conceptual plan acceptable. It's very important that the Army Corps have adequate dimensioning incorporated in their future berm design proposal for considering an ADA ramp accessibility for the 23 streets in the Rockaways. Um, as shown in a typical new street and sidewalk design, having bollards and greenway incorporated by, uh, by Department of Transportation and Department of Design and Construction, it must be mentioned that the bollards were purchased by uh, Congressman uh, Urich's office and not the uh, city of New York councilman. councilman. Um, this is a photograph of what we're trying to propose as the entrance to the 23 streets uh, where we have Moby mats and there's the beach wall and internal inside the beach wall entranceway uh, has just been recently completed the re-concreting uh, re of that walkway. Uh, the Parks and Recreation has related in the past correspondence to the beach communities the following information. For the 2016 beach season, Parks will be providing Moby mats for each beach and 127th Street to 149th Street in the Bell Harbor and the Ponset neighborhoods. This uh, will be the same configuration for the Moby mats installed in this past beach season, which was met with a lot of positive feedback from the community. Uh, I just want to report that there was possibly about 20 to 25 Moby mats missing in this area of Rockaway. Uh, I don't know where they disappeared from, and um, I do request the Parks Department to revisit this and supply Moby mats for the entrances to the beach area so that people pulling their, their carts and people with handicaps can have a, a better footing in getting up and down the berms. Thank you. Hank Iori. Push the button. Okay, Hank Iori. I'm the president of the Bell Harbor Property Owners Association, and I'm also on board 14. I'm here to discuss the resiliency concerns in our community of Bell Harbor, Naponset, Rockaway Park, and across the Rockaway Peninsula. Since our experience with Hurricane Sandy, the number one priority has been protection for the community. I was glad to see that the Army Corps person came out and said the same thing. That said, it's where you put your money and where the action is. I'm certain it is true that all communities impact, impact on Hurricane Sandy. I've heard from you. I could wave to you when I'm on the Bay side because I know you're there and you're concerned. We will. That'll be nice. Uh, in the Rockaways, the ocean side, Bell Harbor, Neponset, and a section of Rockaway Park need reinforced berms or dunes, whatever you want to call them. To the specifications of the Army Corps of Engineers, rock jetties, which is questionable if they'll give them to us because we had, when they had their, sense, their, their meetings with communities, we said we don't want you to stop on 123rd Street, we want to go all the way to 149th Street. So that's something we want the Army Corps to reconsider and do. Sand replenishment they'll do, and we're even thinking reefs wouldn't be a bad idea to uh, deal with the surges so that they never quite make it to shore and, and do the kind of destruction they do. The rock, uh, uh, and so in, uh, um, let's see. Okay, Rockaway Park certainly in their situation 
and John has done a very good job of pointing out they need the rock jetties and they need the sand. We're all one rock away, and that's kind of the way I view it. On the bay side, sea walls, bulkheads are needed in certain sections. Um, two months ago, I did a, spread, uh, did a uh, PowerPoint just by taking maps off Google, and you can see for yourself the areas where there's a heavy population. Our, our area consists of 2,000 homes. Auburn has a lot of homes on the bay side that do get flooded. So it's easy. You know the community well, Andrew, and you don't, you don't have to be a rocket scientist to see what you see. Okay. Um, I, I had the opportunity to read the subcommittee's um, oversight right up. Um, page one, I've noticed that the, the Parks Department says that we've got 14 miles of beaches uh, that they deal with. We're about 38% of all of them out in the Rockaways, 5.2 miles. Not taking into consideration what goes on on Reese Park, which that's another story in dealing with the federal government and seeing that they do the right thing by us, and going all the way to Breezy Point. So there's a lot of beach there that has to be looked at and really dealt with. Um, because of the, is that for me? Yes. Yeah. Minutes. You get three minutes? Oh my God, I didn't know. I'm so sorry. <laughs> I'll try to speed it up. Okay. So also going into the uh, oversight, um, because of the climate change, rate, this is in your own report that I read, uh, because of climate change, rates of beach erosion are expected to double or triple by the year 2020. Um, like clue in, it's happening already. It's not by 2020. Uh, we can see it right now. It's obvious. Uh, the Army Corps was authorized by the federal government to speed $26 million through for 2036. That's speed? 26 by 2000, okay. On Coney Island and $10 million for, uh, on 2020 for the Rockaways. Too little, too late. Okay, shoreline uh, um, armory, and they do point out jetties and uh, groins and seawalls, but it's, let's get them in. Let's not talk about them. Uh, eight recent works in uh, eight recent uh, work in Coney Island. Okay, whatever. Uh, engaging in the limited coastal management practices. Uh, projects are primarily managed by the Army Corps. The city and the state need to take greater um, responsibility, considering the lack of vision and action in Washington. We turn on our TVs every day, and we know what's going on in Washington, and it is so confusing that we doubt that anything's going to happen of any great substance. Uh, so, you know, we came over the ferry, we walked down Court St uh, Wall Street, we went to Trinity Church and we said hello and pay our, our best wishes to Alexander Hamilton and his wife because this is a great city and it has such roots, strong roots in people who really care. We all very much care. It's not just people from different... and. We do great things. So we need to tackle it. And it, that's where we look for the money to come from, quite honestly. It's the city and the state, at the very least, because the federal government, we're just not going to get it. What the Army Corps says and what the Army Corps does, they've got tons of reports that are, have never really seen the light of day. And, and in fact, hard, hard things happening. Um, and if you could just try and wrap up, Mr. Yore, please. Sure, sure. Um, I like what John said about the, uh, what happened with us with the um, putting in the, 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 uh, the Parks was willing to spend a lot of money on putting in these um, uh, things to go in, to go over the berm and whatever, ADA compliant ramps. We said no and they backed off because we said the, par the Army Corps keeps saying they're going to do it and why put something up that could torn out in a few years. Then came time that they had 120 million dollars left over. Now they would have spent some of that money, I suppose, on those ramps. When we asked for what John showed as far as bike racks and simple amenities when you enter the beach, they said, we can't do it. And we said, why? They said, well, the state won't let us do it. We have real questions as to why the State Department of Environmental Conservation would step in and say we can't do it. When you look and take into consideration all the concrete that was put up along the beach uh, for the boardwalk, they actually moved the boardwalk on eight blocks forward. To end, I'd like to invite everybody to come down to the Rockaways. I'd really appreciate it if you came to see the community, 
You can even get some bicycles. You can take a ride on the boardwalk. You can come to our area. That's really where this meeting should be, because when you Thank see you. it, you begin to understand what we're saying. And what we're really saying right now, we need your support. Thank you. Thank you. All right. My name is Nick de Blasi. I live at 133rd Street on the beachfront. And when Sandy hit, it destroyed my house. It ripped it in half. It made it look like a dollhouse. The reason why I came here is because I'm a builder. And when I see the city spend money foolish, it just shocks me. Now, the beach had six foot baffle walls. They want to call them baffle walls. It had six foot baffle walls wood footings. Sandy came along and knocked them right down. And the reason why it knocked them down, because whoever installed the footings, installed the footings like it was a home. In other words, they only put an 18 inch uh, f uh, foundation you know, of the footing and then they put the wall. Now, when we do walls and say, for instance, that we're going to have a, a pool inside of it, instead of putting a foundation in the middle, we put an L foundation. And depending on the size of the wall is the determination how far out you come with the foundation. So this way, the weight of the water has a harder time slamming against it and pulling it. So when they started building the baffle walls, they came and they dropped off steel I-beams. Then when they took the steel I-beams, they, they pound them into the sand. The, the steel I-beams were 20 feet long. They, they put them into the sand, and they left four feet sticking out of the ground. Okay? So now what they did was they came along and they put concrete walls four foot high, and they slid it in, into the, the, between the I-beams, and then they slid the second one on top of it. So I says to Hank, I said, Hank, the found... The, the, the steel beams are in the sand. They have no foundation, okay? The walls that they put in, we had six foot high walls. Now we only got four foot high walls, okay? And the walls are inside between the, the, the two steel beams. I said, as soon as the water just touches it, the wall's going to come down. Now, he was having work done on his block, and they had a small bobcat, small bobcat. And the bobcat went to turn around and hit his wall, and the wall went flying right into the beach. Now, I don't know what the Army and Corps does and how they analyze what they build and how they do it, but I'm a builder, and whatever I build, when Sandy hit my house and destroyed my whole side of my foundation, what I did on my foundation, the foundation is usually 18 inches, I did them four feet. They're usually only one foot deep, I did them three foot deep. The walls as you put them up, they're usually 12 inches. I did them 18 inches. And then every 10 feet, I went three feet with a steel I-beam in it with rebar running all the way across it that if the ocean comes and if my house goes down, there is no rockaway. <laughs> and then I took the, the, the sidewalk and I put rebar and I drilled it into all the foundation and on six-inch frames, I bolted them together. When they put the pad... One more minute, one second... <laughs> when they put the pad, they'd put a pad in between the walls when you walk into the beach. So the first one they put in, I said, why ain't you putting rebar in it to lock the pad into those two walls? They said, no, they wanted that if the ocean comes up, it takes it away. So what they, they, they actually put wood around the floor and then poured the concrete. Now imagine you doing your sidewalk, you put wood around the thing and then pour the concrete. They made it self-standing. If the ocean comes up, that, that sucker's gonna ride right down the block. It doesn't make sense the way they do things. I really, you know, that's it. That's, I got nothing right. else to say. Uh, I, think, I think Build It Back should consider hiring you, sir. Uh, they, they could use your expertise and, and assistance. What do you think, John? Of course. Yeah, I, I do I believe do, yeah. that the public advocate has uh, yeah. a question or comment for the panel. Yeah, just one question. So as we heard earlier, there's $120 million left from the boardwalk. What are your thoughts with regards to where that $120 million should be spent? Well, the extra $120 million should have been $200 million because they overspent on the boardwalk. They, uh, the parks claims they didn't, but the money was supposed to be for resiliency, the extra $200 million. But look so, at the so, so, so let me just finish. It's just, so, so that's the big issue. And what, what was pointed out, what, why Eric's so upset, Eric Ulrich, is that, that, that to this date, one mile of shorefront parkway that had parks on it does not exist. Mm. 
That extra money came to replace Shorefront Parkway. Now there's a big money grab to put parks all over the place, and that money is for Shorefront Parkway, and there's something wrong. To this date, those parks are not back. To this date. 27 handball courts, raised flower beds, 150 park benches. Imagine if you had districts, the parks weren't back by now. So no one's it, talking about it. So will that money be used to replace the Very, parks? very little. Very little. Like and two playgrounds, two playgrounds of it. And are those resiliency projects or amenity projects? Well, it, under 428A, yeah. one of the projects counted as, as um, resiliency and one didn't. But 428, because it was parks damaged by Hurricane Sandy. Part of the, the project now, Parks is picking parks that are perfectly in good shape now, and they're looking to replace them, renovate parks. Very unusual, but that's what's going on. And lastly, so. the application is currently pending before the mayor, before the administration? Excuse me? The application with respect to these projects is currently pending before the mayor of the city of New York? No, I think with FEMA. It's in FEMA? Yeah. Okay, thank you. Can okay. I just say one more thing? If, if there was another storm, when the storm hits, where the Park Department built the broadwalk, there's so much concrete there that the protection on that area is fantastic. If another storm hits in Bell Harbor or the Ponset with that little tissue paper we have in the middle of it, we have nothing. We, they did nothing for Bell Harbor and the Ponset. We have nothing. Because we had a six-foot wall, now we have a four-foot wall. We had a six-foot wall with a foundation, now we got a four-foot wall. We, nothing. We have nothing. So if another storm hits, Bell Harbor and the ponds is going to disappear. Not my house. May I say something? Quickly, uh, sir. That yes. $120 million, I, I believe, should be all for resiliency around the whole perimeter of the Rockaways and so forth, building up walls for protection. But for the Parks Department to say they want to use some of that money for accessories for a park, like a, let's put in a kayak uh, landing and, a, and buy some more trees, that's, a, that's, no, that's no good. Right. That money should come from the city of New York, not from the $120 million. And are you gentlemen invited to the meeting with, the, with Senator Schumer? Not yet. Not yet. Thank you. Chair Traeger? Yeah, I was just going to uh, reference this, uh, that our, our futures and our security are tied together, regardless if I represent Coney Island and Seagate, uh, the exact same concerns you've shared are the same concerns I hear in my, in my community as well. And this study, that this Jamaica Bay study actually includes all of our neighborhoods in one group. So when we'll be meeting with our congressional partners, I, I am fighting for you just like I'm fighting for Southern Brooklyn because we are tied together. I'm not looking just to help my district. This is a citywide issue, and uh, the photographs are powerful. John, thank you for, uh, for, for producing them because it, it, it is frightening. Uh, it, it really is, and, and I could show you images in Seagate as well where it's, where it's frightening too. And uh, so we, and that's why I asked the Army Corps if you heard my question, there, there'll still be opportunities for public input because they need to hear this. They need to hear from you. You live there. You know this better. Than, and that's, by the way, one of the criticisms that happened in New Orleans with Katrina and, and their levy systems is that they were faulted for a lack of community input, a lack of, uh, of uh, engagement. And so you need to be at the front lines of this, of this discussion. But first, we have to make sure that we uh, secure these funds. The type of funds that they're talking about uh, I believe we will need some federal assistance, but I agree with you. The state and city have to chip in. In Staten Island, that's what they're doing. And, uh, and we have to do the same thing across all five boroughs. Mark, we're definitely, you see we're having this uh, big rally on, uh, on, on June 25th, starting at, uh, at 87th Street. And we're trying to get Senator Schumer down, Senator uh, Congressman Meeks, Congressman Jeffries, to all come down and try to make sure that they all bring us to $4 billion. And that's very important. We're with you 100 percent. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Pat. Your microphone, uh, Hank. I like the fact that you brought up the whole thing about flood insurance. That's a train coming down the tracks. Yes, yes. And if we don't join together, and we had a meeting on Tuesday where we had the city's Office of Resilience and a representative there, and we brought up the point to her, well, the boardwalk on a 90th Street at the very least, if we had a Hurricane Sandy, the water wouldn't go over. The, it, it would be defeated by that boardwalk. It would stop the flooding. So would that 
allow us to start fighting for the flood insurance to be reduced because eventually it's going to go from four, five hundred dollars to three, four thousand right. dollars on homes. And so they said no, and they basically said it's the whole city we have to protect before they'll be able to consider that. So the, the, the flood insurance issue is a terrible situation that we have to fight on the federal level. The Stadford Act is a mess. It's a total mess. Agreed. It's, it's illogical what they've done there. We have to ask them to sit down and rethink it. And, and come up with a plan that makes some sense so that people don't get burned in situations like uh, Agreed 100%. Hurricane Sandy. Can I say something Thank about you. the flood insurance to, to help you? Qu quickly, sir, because we have another panel waiting um, to speak. I, the, my flood insurance was $700. It went to 5000 hmm. I called up, and I wanted to know why it went to 5000 They said because of the sea level and so forth. I says, my house is eight feet higher than the street level. They says, well, we don't know that. You have to prove it. So I had to get an elevation certificate. I did all that, and they reduced it back to seven hundred dollars. How much did it cost you to get it? Uh, Four hundred dollars. See, I no, no. But the point that why I, I took this few minutes to tell you is that the, they told me that they're sending everyone a bill like their house is below sea level, and then it's your job to prove that it's not. So there's going to be a lot of people that live in Seagate, wherever it is, when they get the bill, they're just going to pay it. So I have, I have a bill that's in process of drafting to address this head-on, because I'm hearing more and more cases about this. And also, quite frankly, the city of New York uh, should be helping you pay for that certificate. You should not have to prove about sea the levels in, in your property. It's just well, four hundred dollars to you, but in, in parts of my district, that that's a lot of money. As no, as but well. thank it's you, not Mark. because yeah. of that. It's because the only point I was trying to bring out is that if you don't pick up the phone and say my house is not under sea level, correct, you're going to be charged like you. You're right. Excellent point. Thank you very much. Thank you. I, I believe that Councilmember Perkins, you have a comment. I don't. I just. Well, I, I have to leave, no. and I just want to apologize for, uh, that I have to leave. No, but would, I would you like you to know that? You know, whatever we have, we can do together to be helpful. I just want you to know my absence should not suggest uh -huh. otherwise. Okay? We thank we you. Be supportive. Thank you, Councilmember Lots Perkins. Of love from Harlem. Thank All right, you. thank Harlem you. Loves you. That's right. All right, and our our next and final panel is Jose Sogard from the Waterfront Alliance and Brett Bronco from the Science and Resilience Institute at Jamaica Bay. All right, take it away. Okay. Good afternoon, um, members of the committee, uh, Chairperson Levine, Chairperson Traeger. Um, thanks for the opportunity to provide this testimony. My name is Brett Branco. I'm speaking on behalf of Brooklyn College and on behalf of the Science Resilience Institute at Jamaica Bay. Um, the Institute is a partnership between the City of New York the National Park Service, and eight research institutions. Uh, together, we work with communities, agencies, and non-governmental groups in and around Jamaica Bay to support resilient life and livelihoods throughout the Jamaica Bay watershed. Uh, as you consider managing beach erosion, keep in mind that well-intended interventions in one location uh, will have adverse consequences in other locations because uh, the beaches of New York City are part of a regional uh, sand conveyor belt that encompasses all of the south shore of Long Island, including the Rockaways, Coney Island, and Jamaica Bay. For example, from 1844 to 1907, the Rockaway Peninsula grew to the west at a rate of 253 feet per year uh, due to a steady supply of sand from southern Long Island. Um, the United States Geological Survey data reveals that 60% of the shoreline along all of southern Long Island has eroded over the last century. Uh, the construction of groins on the Rockaway Peninsula have had a cascading effect on this sand movement, building up sand on one side and eroding it on the downcurrent side. Moreover, while hard structures have trapped sand coming from Long Island to the Rockaways, shorelines in Jamaica Bay have been isolated from the supply. So for example, National Park Service monitoring data collected by Rutgers University shows that erosion at Plum Beach is exacerbated by less sand coming from the sand conveyor and the dredging of Sheepshead Bay Channel. So looking ahead, the options available today to address beach erosion may not be available in 50 years, and we should think about short and long-term strategies in parallel. Future generations may have less sand, and they will certainly face higher seas. 
There is a finite limit on the available sand that can be used for continued beach nourishment. The Army Corps of Engineers plan to stabilize the erosion on the Rockaway Peninsula assumes that the city or that the beaches will be renourished every three to four years to make up for the inevitable sand losses. While the identified sources of sand are sufficient for the next 50 years, there is a possibility that new sources may be difficult to find or prohibitively expensive to utilize due to the regional trends in erosion. Over the same period, sea level in New York City will likely rise over one foot and possibly close to three feet. Beaches will be squeezed between developed land and encroaching seas. From just 2015 to 2016, there were 18 storms that submerged regional beaches, uh, ranging from roughly half a foot to three feet of storm surge. Any amount of sea level rise will submerge the beaches more frequently, and with an established pattern of erosion, the impacts will increase in magnitude. Communities must be engaged in thinking about the long-term strategies that balance land use policy and infrastructure on the one hand with an evolving sense of place on the other. Communities have helped restore wetlands and maintain beaches at lower cost when they are engaged meaningfully in an ongoing two-way dialogue. The Science and Resilience Institute at Jamaica Bay is a place-based initiative built on partnership and on process. We urge you to provide support to all of our partners for a creative, diverse, and fun series of dialogues on how to help our coastal communities thrive. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon. Uh, I am Jose Sogard, uh, Policy Director for Waterfront Alliance, a nonprofit civic organization committed to restoring and revitalizing New York Harbor and waterways. I'll read a brief summary of our written statement provided to you. And thank you for the opportunity to testify this afternoon. New York City is a city of water, with our waterways serving as a vital resource for commerce, transportation, education, and recreation. Among our most popular waterfront recreation sites are, of course, our bathing beaches. With the exception of Manhattan, every borough enjoys a large stretch of beachfront for swimming, sunbathing, and summertime recreation, from Midland Beach in Staten Island, to Orchard Beach in the Bronx, to Coney Island Beach in Brooklyn, and Rockaway Beach in Queens. Hurricane Sandy's storm surge and wave action wrought substantial damages on our city's beaches to loss as much as three million cubic yards of sand citywide, with the Rockaways accounting for roughly half that loss. And as we've heard today, though beach replenishment is an important tool to restore recreational use and access, as well as wildlife habitats, it is not a cure-all for beach erosion. As well, major storm events, while a significant risk to coastal infrastructure, are not the only contributing factor to beach erosion. Our beaches are the first line of defense against the accelerating threat of sea level rise, which will continue to con claim natural sediment on our beaches and elsewhere, redrawing our coastal maps and displacing coastal residents if we are not prepared. Because beaches are dynamic, and sea level rise will continue to push our beaches and dunes further upland. Groins can prevent a portion of beach sediment from moving seaward, and they, and they can function well when combined with softshore measures like beach nourishment. Uh, for example, a project to stabilize Coney Island Seagate Beach with four large T-groin structures was completed last year. As we've heard earlier today, a plan is in place to build groins on Rockaway Beach, largely the result of significant pressure from community members and other stakeholders. But construction has not yet begun, despite the fact that, according to some reports, much of the sand that has been replenished has been lost to erosion. Long Beach groins are under construction now, with the Hamptons likely to happen next. The Long Island was, likely, uh, was likewise devastated by Hurricane Sandy and faces similar risk of future storms. The potential impacts to residents are greater here in New York City. This year, we launched a new initiative called the Harbor Scorecard, a district-by-district -district dashboard for coastal flood risk, water quality, and public access to the waterways. Using data from Climate Central, a research institution studying climate risk, and taking into account moderate to high-level sea level rise projections, we found that more than 408,000 New Yorkers live in areas with a 50% cumulative chance of experiencing a major storm event in the next few decades, by 2060. That's roughly the population of all of Miami, where a significant beach nourishment project was launched last summer. That total includes roughly 75,000 people in the Rockaways, 81,000 in Coney Island, 37,000 in Sheepshead Bay together exceeding the equivalent risk for Nassau County of 160,000 people or Suffolk County of 65,000 people in an equivalent scenario. And we look forward to working with the council and other stakeholders to ensure that New York City residents are adequately and expeditiously protected from increasing threats posed by climate change, 
strong and stable coastlines for generations to come. Thank you for the opportunity to present this testimony. Thank you, Jose. I just want to get those numbers right. So you're comparing how much is being spent on Long Island to New York City, is that correct? And the relative size of the population and user base? Uh, these are uh, estimates of population living within land below a particular elevation facing a particular uh, percentage cumulative risk of a major storm event over the next, say, 35 years. So if we look regionally, as the court told us, about a quarter of the money allocated so far is earmarked for New York City, we are far, far more than a quarter of the population that's at risk, correct? Um, these figures just account for um, New York City and geographic Long Island. Um, uh, I believe their scope includes uh, New Jersey as well, um, but I believe it's, it's safe to say that New York City accounts for more than a quarter of, of the of the population at risk of significant It's effects. just, it's an important reminder that there's an equity angle here and we have to make sure that New York City doesn't get uh, less than its fair share of resources. I think it's safe to say that. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much, panel. Thank you all for this great hearing. This concludes our hearing.